Our guest commentator for this portion of Court TV is Matthew Rosenblum, a trial lawyer in New York. He's been practicing law for nine years, and welcome back. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah good to see you. Good again. to see you back here. You've handled more than your share of high-profile cases. You represented the, uh, what, one of the attorneys representing Amy Fisher. So let's talk about putting a person on the stand, the defendant. What are the things that you take into consideration before doing this? Well, my first inclination is to always uh, do the best I can at each step with each witness that the prosecution puts on so that it becomes an easy uh, answer for me. And I try not to put the defendant mm -hmm. on the stand. I was listening to Jerry Spence on one of the O.J. Simpson commentary shows last week. He said, never put a truthful client on the stand. The jury won't believe him. <laughs> if you got a psychopath, put him on the stand. They'll believe him. Uh, it's a very difficult thing. It, 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 people uh, aren't experienced at testifying. People who you think in the office might make w good witnesses, might make terrible witnesses uh, on the stand. So uh, you can get a gut reaction whether somebody can be a good witness, witness but always try to do everything you can so that there's so much doubt all over the case that you don't even have to worry about it and you can stand up before the jury and say it wasn't necessary or indicate or implicate that it wasn't necessary if she would have taken the stand so and so forth would have happened in this case you have a video which seems to be exculpatory I haven't seen the whole video so it's a perfect reason for him not to sit, take the stand because you could say look he testified in the video. You saw what he said. And you don't have the advantage then uh, or disadvantage of him being cross-examined exactly. at that point. Not only that, but we were talking about that very same videotape yesterday that in it, when without the benefit of a defense strategy, without the benefit of an attorney at the time the tape was being made, he goes into the point about why he did it. And he uses words like, I was in a rage, I became very angry, I don't remember how many times that I stabbed, you know, at five maybe, whatever else. He's not denying it, but if you were going after this extreme emotional disturbance, it would seem that he's giving it to you right there. Right, and you can argue extreme emotional disturbance is typically characterized, uh, statutorily characterized, by a loss of control. Uh, here's a... Uh, an individual who hasn't spoken to a lawyer, I take it, at the time of the video, doesn't know what the law is, and yet is explaining that he had a loss of control. Mm -hmm. So why put him on the stand, knowing nothing else about the case, when you have an exculpatory video, which at least makes out your, your extreme emotional defense case? On the other hand, the client has the ultimate choice as to whether or not he or she will take the stand. And I've been in situations where my client wanted to take the stand, I didn't want them to take the stand, and it reached a... a situation where we had to put something on the record where I was advising my client not to take the stand and my client was saying uh, in in the court that they may want to take the stand. Well, how do you do that without leaving the jury with a, a kind of negative impression there? Is there a way? This is done outside the presence of the jury. So that they never hear you saying this at all? Right. right. And, and it's actually every time I've done it, it's worked and the client didn't take the stand. I believe I've been successful so in each and every it's, case. So is that your trump card for the client to some extent and try to getting their attention? Well, clients believe, you know, that let me, let me just take the stand, I'll explain it, this and that. And they, you know, everybody's got a, a competitive spirit in them, but you, they hire me not to uh, believe them, befriend them, uh, but they hire me to defend them. If I think I've got it, I've got to be surgical in my analysis of the case. I don't want to jeopardize what I've attained so far. I can get around the fact. Uh, when I pick a jury, typically I say, well, you, if the judge tells you, you can I ho not hold it against him that Mr. Simpson does not take the stand in this case, would you forever wonder? Would you be curious? Can you understand? Maybe he's been through enough. Maybe the people haven't met their burden. Will you hold it against my client if he, he or she doesn't take the stand? And you try to pick a jury that is conditioned to the fact that your client is probably not going to take the stand and hope that they figure the reason why is just there's no case and they've been through enough and, and so on and so forth. Or too fearful or some of these other things about it. We're, we're going to go a little bit more into that.